All right, actually, before we go further in the text, I wanted to address some questions that came in. Uh, Baruch Hashem, there was uh, a lot of uh, participation and involvement and just in the past 23 hours, or I guess 23 and a half hours since we finished last night's shear, we got a bunch of emails and comments regarding the class. So uh, one question was, what is the source for the marshal about faith and trust being like a tree and fruits? Uh, where does the Rambam say it? And then actually I looked back and I saw that I did say the Rambam. There was a plate that's up there. I misspoke. It's the Ramban. The Ramban actually have a, has a whole sefer called Sefer Ho'amunah Vahabitochim. And uh, at the beginning of the sefer, he actually presents that parable, that marshal, explaining the difference between faith and trust, that it's like trees and fruit. You might have a tree that doesn't grow fruits, but if you see fruits, you know that it came from a tree. So a person might only have faith and not yet get to the point where he puts his trust in Hashem. But if you see somebody putting his trust in Hashem, then surely uh, he has faith as well. He believes. Uh, and as long as I'm clarifying the, uh, the sources from last night, um, I should mention that the mushal of Shtayim uh, Royis Osa Ami, that my people have uh, done two bad things. The, the mushal about they, they abandoned the source of living water and they dug for themselves broken cisterns. So that's, of course, a mushal from the famous composer of Mashalim, the Dubna Magid. And in fact, it is told that when the Kotzker Rav heard that mushal, he said that of all the explanations that could have ever been crafted for that verse, this one is the ultimate explanation, the one that the Dubna Magid came up with. The, the metaphor of the, the, the father-in-law and the son-in-law and the, uh, the wagon load of toothpicks and the wagon load of Schaeferis. Um Okay, regarding some questions, somebody asked, we explained last night that if, if somebody puts his trust in something or someone other than Hashem, so Hashem removes his providence from the person and puts him in the hands or at the whim and the will of that thing that the person is erroneously trusting in. So I mentioned last night that of, that of course Hashem is always conducting the world through divine providence, but it'll just seem to the person as if he's been abandoned to cruel fate. That's his punishment for believing that other forces that Hashem rule his life, so that it will seem to him as if that's really so. So a question came in, where am I basing this on? And, and, and I didn't give a source, and uh, I suppose I should have, and maybe we'll be better about uh, providing sources. But this is actually uh, what I shared was based on a sicha from the Lubavitcher Rebbe in Lukuti Sichas, Chelik Yud Ches. It's a Sicha in Parshish Kairach. And uh, the Sicha itself is very worth studying inside from beginning to end. Um, but it deals with many issues of Hashkocha Pratis. And one of them, including uh, reconciling the apparent contradiction between the approach toward Hashgacha that's espoused by the Rambam, now I am saying Rambam, Maimonides. By the way, who's Maimonides? The Rambam. Who's your Maimonides? I don't know. Anyways. No, he's all of our Maimonides. Anyways. Um, the Rambam and Meira Novuchim uh, seems to say that Hashgacha Pratis is not the rule but an exception. And, and that it does not apply to the inanimate, the vegetable, and the animal, but rather only to minim and daber, to human beings, and within human beings only to tzaddikim, only to the righteous, depending on their dveikis hasechel. That's the hakira lashen, the philosophical uh, idiom that the Rambam uses there, dveikis hasechel. So, and, and people whose minds are cleaving to, to godliness, so they will have the ability to uh, have their lives conducted by Ashkachal Pratis, but others will not. Now the Baal Shem Tov says that that's not so, that Ashkachal Pratis extends to all of us, and not just to all of the 
minamadabra, not just to all human beings, but to animal and plant and even inanimate. So how do you reconcile the two? The Rebbe there, in, in this Sikha, explains the difference between the chitzenius and the pneumius, the outer appearance of things and the inner workings that are really going on. And that this concept of dveikus hasechel, the, the person's uh, mind cleaving to Hashem, that really, that what the Rambam is saying is that it's not that per, a person, one person merits to have his life run and conducted only by Hashem, and other people don't merit that. No, he merits to see it. The dveikus hasechel means that he'll be zeichet to see the Yad Hashem in his life. That he'll never feel even when he has ups and downs in life, perhaps, in life, perhaps, but he'll never feel abandoned to cruel fate. He'll see hashgocha, and that's what requires the dveikos hasechel. Mashein can, in contrast, somebody who thinks it's all random. Well, that's exactly what he'll see. That he, he, he'll see that that's the way that that life is run. The truth is, bepnimios, they're both experiencing hashgocha pratis. The difference is only the hester pun. Hashem says that I will conceal my face. That con the concealment means that you won't see the hashgacha pratis, even though the etzim, in essence, everything is hashgacha pratis. Uh, but again, this sicha, Lukut sicha's chelet yud ches, parshas kairach, is uh, very worthwhile studying from beginning to end. Another question came in. Somebody asked regarding the same subject. If, if you remove your trust from Hashem and you put your trust in someone or something else, then you will be at the whim of that someone or something. So somebody wrote in a question, well, what if I like it? What if I like it? What if I like the way they're treating me? So I have two answers. To that. that's, that's, a, that's a great question. You know why it's a great question? Because I never thought of it. Um, I have two answers to that question. One, one answer is... If you'll wait and hang on, you'll see that Rabbeinu Bechaya speaks about the criteria or the qualifications that are possessed by he who is worthy of our trust. And he helps us actually logically conclude that we shouldn't put our trust in anyone but Hashem. He, he, he brings us through logically the steps that Ultimately, no one is worthy of our trust other than Hashem. So that's that's a simple answer uh, that occurred to me, and uh, you know that's just because I've been through the text before, so I know what's up ahead, and I can tell you that's what's coming. But then I thought of another answer as well, and um, you may or may not agree with this, but this is something that I felt was this is what I would answer myself. This was this would be the answer that I would want to hear. And that is, ultimately, a relationship with Hashem is not about what's good for me. It's not about figuring out um, what's going to make the best payoff. Ultimately, serving Hashem is surrender, is bittel, selflessness. We give ourselves to Hashem. And because we also believe that he is the ultimate in goodness and he knows what's good for us, we believe that that'll work out. Somehow, that'll work out well for us as well. But that's not why we do it. Ultimately, we choose Hashem because Hashem is Hashem. And there is no reality like Hashem. There's no being that is like Hashem. And ultimately, it's about the relationship. In other words, you know, where does Aveda Zara come from? Idolatry, where does it come from? It comes from an actually true concept that there are intermediaries in the world. And um, Hashem appoints these different forces or powers as tools through which he conducts the universe. That's the true part. Now, the erroneous conclusion, which is idolatrous, is the person says, you know, I will get better customer service if I make sure that the secretary knows who I am, right? Make sure that, you know, on secretary's day, you send a, a cake to the secretary because 
The secretary really runs the world, right? And don't worry about the CEO because he's on the golf course and he's too busy and he's not going to take your calls and uh, he, he's hanging out with the big wigs and he doesn't have time for you. So if I'm going to be smart, if I make sure that the secretary knows who I am and thinks I'm a good guy, that'll be a lot more effective. That'll work a lot better for me than trying to win the attention of the CEO who's way too big and powerful and busy uh, to, to, to care about me. And that's what idolatry is. Idolatry is, I would rather receive from an intermediary if it's going to be a better payoff than to receive from the king of all kings um, if it's not going to be the payoff that I want. So Yiddishkeit comes and says, you know what? I don't care. I don't care if I get less. I don't care if I don't get what I think I deserve. I want to get what the king wants to give. Because the king's not just the king, the king is my father, the king. Imagine if somebody had, a, had a, an, an heirloom from their father. Their father, their, their father gave them a watch. And it wasn't an expensive watch. Your father took you out one day and he bought you a watch. It's a $50 watch. And then let's say somebody stole your watch or broke your watch. And then they, they told you, oh, don't worry about it. I'll buy you a new watch. I'll buy you a $1,000 watch. I don't want the $1,000 watch. I want the watch from my father. So even if I will get a better watch, from some other place. I don't want from some other place. I want what my father has to give me. I want what Hashem has in, in, in store for me. So even if there's a, an alternative scenario of my life that I could get by putting my trust in something other than Hashem, which I think is a better story than the actual story that Hashem wants to tell me, no, I'm not going to do that. I want my hashpo, I want my, my, my sustenance, my influence to come straight from the source. So that's, that's the answer that I would want to hear if, if, I, if I would have thought of that question. Um, okay. Let's go into the text now. And if the person places trust in his own wisdom and his own schemes and his physical strength and his own efforts, his hishtablos, Hashem will abandon him, relinquish him to himself. In other words, you want to take care of yourself? You think you've got this? No problem. So take care of yourself. You've got this. We've got a governor who just told us that the, the, they started to flatten the curve now. The, the numbers are better. And God didn't do it, he says. He says, we did this. Okay. All right. Fine. Very good. Very good. Great message. God didn't do it. We did this. Okay. So then you're on your own. So then you're on your own. You want to rely on human power? You've got it. You can rely on human power. All right. So it continues. And Abena Bechaye says, if the person decides that he's going to rely on himself, ye galorik, his toil will be for naught. The yachlish teiche, he'll actually become weak. V'sikser tachbulosei, v'hasig heftsei, and his schemes will fall short of attaining what he desires, Kamesha Amara Kosov, like the verse says in Eov, Leichid Chachamim Ba'ormam Hashem traps clever people in their shrewdness. Their plans backfire. The Amar, and it says in Kehalas, Shlaim Amalek, the wisest of all men, says, Shavti Vroi Sachas Hashemish, I returned and I saw under the sun, Kiloi Lekalem Hameroits that the race does not belong to the, to the, to the swift. And the, the battle is not won by the strong. And bread does not go to the wise. Wise here means people who have smart ideas about how they're going to uh, make money. They're not going to. And furthermore, it says in Tehillim, Kfirim roshu v'ro'evu, young lions want and are hungry, However, those who seek Hashem, they will not lack any good. 
continues. The im yiftach berev ashra. And what if, let's say, he depends upon his abundant wealth? What's going to happen? We said before, if he, he relies on his schemes, his schemes are going to uh, backfire. What if he relies on his wealth? You sarmi meno v'yishar l'zulase. It will be removed from him and left to someone else. Like the scripture says, the rich man lies down with his wealth intact. Then he opens his eyes, he gets up, it's gone, disappeared overnight. And furthermore, it says in Mishlam, do not toil to become wealthy and desist from your own understanding. And it says, furthermore, before you can even set your eyes on it, it's gone. The wealth disappears. And it says, At a young age, one's wealth will leave him. So, depending on wealth, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow, can all disappear. Fortunes can be lost in a moment. However, hold on a second. I see people who are self-reliant and they are wealthy. They didn't lose their wealth. Okay, so let's continue. I, or alternatively, what might happen? Not that he'll lose his wealth, but it will be prevented from him from enjoying it. Kasher Amr Achacham, like the wise man, which Shlomo Melech said, "V'loy yashli tenu hu elakim lechol mimenu," and Hashem will not give him the power to eat of it. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means it's not what you earn; it's what you keep. It's not the gross; it's the net. Remember a guy one time who never he was he was Shemer Shabbos and and and. But he was struggling with it, and uh, he, he came into shul, and he confessed that I started working on, on Friday night. He says, I started driving, and he says, and it's a, it's a good thing because I got to tell you something. Um, after I started making extra money, my car broke down, and I, had, I needed repairs. And uh, so it was a good thing I had that extra money, or I wouldn't have been able to pay for the repairs. And... <laughs> I just I remember I was much younger then I, I was young I kept my mouth quiet but I remember the rabbi uh, very gently saying um, is it possible that maybe if you hadn't been driving that you wouldn't even need these repairs so in the end what did you gain you made more money on Shabbos but there it goes it went in and it, it went right out so it's not what you earn it's what you keep don't look at uh, how wealthy people are, look at what they're actually keeping. And by keeping, by the way, that doesn't just mean that they're wealthy. It means spending it on good things. It doesn't mean spending it on doctor bills. There's plenty of ways that wealth can be spent, unfortunately, on uh, putting out fires and uh, trying to solve all types of problems. The money will stay by him, but only so long. It's like a deposit that he's guarding for the person who it's going to go to eventually, the person who's worthy of it. To the sinner, he gives the urge to gather and amass wealth, to give to one who is good in front of the Almighty. In other words, this guy is making money, but he's, he's, he's not going to keep it in the end. He's making the money because he's holding on to it for the guy who really deserves it. And it says, Yochin v'tzadik yilbash v'chesev noki yachlek. That he, the wicked man, will prepare and the righteous man will use it. And the innocent will divide the money among themselves. So he doesn't even keep his wealth. Although there's another, there's another scenario. The Avshar, it's possible also. Shia hamom in sibis ra'osei. Of the nafshay, the money will actually be a cause of misfortune and the destruction of his soul. Kamishikosov, like it says, Yesh ra chayla reisi tachas hashamesh. There's a sickening evil that I've seen under the sun. Oisher shamer lebaylov l'ra osay. Riches hoarded by their owner to his misfortune. This is even more than what we said before, that he won't be able to enjoy as well. This is this takes it even further. 
the wealth itself will be a cause of misfortune. You know, they did a study with lottery winners, people who suddenly went rags to riches overnight. And they found, first of all, 70% of people were bankrupt within five years. Okay, they didn't keep the wealth. They didn't keep the money. But another thing is they found that the majority of lottery winners say that it was the worst thing that ever happened to them. It ruined their lives. So first of all, you'll, you'll, re you'll, you'll rely on wealth and you'll lose it. Or if you don't lose it, you'll keep it, but you're not spending it on anything good. You're not really enjoying it. It's making you miserable. And the third alternative is all types of rich people problems that you wouldn't have without the money. So the money is actually not a blessing at all in your life. It's actually a curse. As opposed to what? I'm not saying that being rich is a curse, God forbid. As opposed to what we're saying, a person who's beteach in Hashem, the person who has trust in Hashem, then he could actually enjoy his wealth. He could be wealthy, but he doesn't put his trust in the wealth. He knows he's wealthy. He sees it as a responsibility. He knows that, mean, that means he has to be more aware of the, of, of, of the needs of his community. He has to step up. He has to be the one to set an example. He has to give tzedakah. So he sees it as, as a duty. And, uh, and he's humbled by it. He's humbled because it's a gift. Hashem has entrusted him with the wealth. So that's a person he's going to enjoy the wealth because he's not trusting in the wealth. He's not worshiping the money, God forbid. He's worshiping Hashem, and in fact, the money helps him to worship Hashem because he can do all types of things for Hashem with the wealth. Okay. Um, so, so the Beit HaBachaya says that if he relies upon his own hishtadwas, that this isn't going to work out for him. So this is a question a lot of people ask. You know, what's wrong with hishtadwas? What's wrong with making a... a, 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 a a normal effort in things. And, and, and the answer is there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. And in fact, later on in chapter four of Shara Betochen, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar will say clearly that Hishtadlus and Betochen go hand in hand. That you're supposed to figure out what's the normal, logical, responsible course of action. You're supposed to do that. But also have the tokens. So what does it mean? A little bit of this and a little bit of that. A little shtadlus, a little bit token, and you mix and match and you put them. No, that's not what it means. They're two separate things. They're two totally separate things. Bitochen doesn't obviate the need for shtadlus. And shtadlus doesn't obviously obviate the need for bitochen. They do two totally separate things. But you have to understand how it works. Hashem is sending us mon all the time. Everything is mon. Everything is just bread from heaven. Whatever it is, all the blessings in our lives, they're coming from Hashem. But um, Hashem wants things to go in a natural way. He doesn't want open miracles. Hashem created the laws of nature, and he wants to preserve them. Like the Drosh Haran ex explains that Hashem doesn't do uh, Nisa Lemagona. He doesn't do miracles for naught, because he made the, the, the Chuke Hatav, and he tries to preserve them. So what does it mean? Hishtadlus, that's a healthy Hishtadlus. It means you're giving Hashem a cover. You're giving him plausible deniability. He has to have an alibi. Everything's a miracle, but it can't look like a miracle. It has to look like it's normal, it's natural. It just happened because of, you know, like Como said, we did it, we did it. But we know we didn't do it, Hashem did it, but it has to make it look like it was natural. So the Hishtadlus is like a vessel. It's like a kli, holding out a vessel to allow the miraculous blessings from Hashem to, to take hold, to be able to receive the blessings. But our Ishtadlis doesn't really create the blessings. It's just a container to hold them here in this natural world. And, and therefore, what's going to be the real difference? It's going to come down to your feelings. The Tochen means where you place your sense of security. So your hishtadlus is something you do because you got to hold out a cup, okay? You want to catch the, 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 the brachas, you got to hold the cup, fine. But it's something you do because you, you got to do. That's not what gives you your security. That's not what makes you say, oh, now I'm okay. I have, a, I have hishtadlus. No, hishtadlus is like a, it's an afterthought. It's a yetzizai. The real thing is the brachas from Hashem. And that's where the sense of peace and serenity comes from. So how do you know that your Ishtadlis is a healthy Ishtadlis? Is when you do the responsible, normal, logical thing, 
And then you totally relax and you say, Hashem, you're taking care of it. I did the thing that I'm supposed to do. I showed up for work. I, uh, you know, I, I went to the doctor, whatever the normal course of of things within nature, and now Hashem's taking care of me. In fact, Hashem was taking care of me all along, and this is just the vessel I'm holding out to allow myself to be able to receive it. Um, it connected to this, the Alter Rebbe, uh, the Balatanya in Lekutei Teirah says that uh, regarding the Pasuk in Tilim, Yegiyah kapecha kiseichal asherecha v'tevloch that when you eat from the toil of your hands, you're fortunate and it's good for you. So what does that mean? Yegiya kapecha. Kapecha means the hands. Hands means the external capacities of a person. It doesn't mean literally you have to be a manual laborer, but it means it's, a, it's as if you were a manual laborer. It's just your hands. Your hands as opposed to what? Your mind, your heart. When you do your hishtadlus, when you make your effort in a natural, responsible way, it's just kapecha, it's just you show up and you do the thing you're supposed to do. But that's not where you're putting your head and it's not where you're putting your heart. Your head and your heart you're giving completely to Hashem. So the sense of well-being, that everything's going to be the way it needs to be, that's because of Hashem, not because of the Hishtalus. The Hishtalus is just show up, you suit up, and you do, you do the thing you're supposed to do. There's a story that one time there was a guy back in Russia, before the revolution, he was a factory owner, a Jewish factory owner. And his factory produced galoshes, rubber boots that people wear in the rain. So he was a chassid, and he went to Lubavitch, the town of Lubavitch, for a Shabbos. And uh, it was the time of the Rebbe Rashab. So the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe of Chabad, he saw this guy's preoccupied all Shabbos. He saw his mind is on his business, on the galoshes factory that, that, that he ran. So. After Shabbos, the Rebbe Shabbos says to this guy, he says, you know, this is a first for me. I've seen a lot of people with their feet in their galoshes. This is the first time I'm seeing somebody with his head in his galoshes. What does that mean? That means you get kapecho. You run a galoshes factory, fine. So put your hands in it, put your feet in it. You show up, you do the things you got to do. Go through the motion, so to speak. But don't put your head in it. The head, the heart, that we leave for learning Torah, for having Avas Hashem, for having Yiras Hashem. And uh, that's, the, that's the healthy distinction between where his tablet belongs and where it doesn't belong. Okay. Um, I'll mention just one last thing, and that is from the Pas Lechem. There are a few Meforshim on Cheves Olavavis, and one of them is called Pas Lechem by Horav Chaim Avram Katz, who was a, a, a preacher, a Magid, back in, uh, in Russia. So he wrote uh, a Pirush on Cheves Lovavis. He points out something interesting. What does Rubena Bechaya say about a person who trusts in himself? The qualities he lists, the Paslechem points out, correspond to a Pasuk in Yermio, and it says, Ke Amar Hashem, Hashem says, Al Yishalu Chochem Bechachmose, a wise person shouldn't praise himself for his wisdom. The strong man shouldn't praise himself for his strength. And the rich man shouldn't praise himself for his riches. But rather, rather, this is the only thing that a person should be proud of, which is his ability to know me, says Hashem. So don't be proud if you're rich or if you're strong or if you're wise. The only thing to, to be proud of is knowing Hashem. It means learning Torah and meditating and davening and thinking about Hashem all the time. Okay, so it's interesting. There's a sicha from the Lubav Rebbe, Parshas Eikif, Tavshim Memches. And the Rebbe mentions this and he says, you know, it sounds like it's saying that a person should never be proud of those things. But it's funny because, you know, some of these qualities, if you look where the Ramam talks about Nevoa, he says that Nabi has to have all these things. He has to be rich and he has to be strong and he has to be wise. So, what gives? So the Rebbe explains like this. These things are not a problem to have. To the contrary, they're good things to have. If that's not what you're proud of, that's not what you're praising yourself about. But rather, 
if your pride is in knowing Hashem, if what you value is knowing Hashem, like the verse continues, what should you only, what should the person be mishalal in? is v'yadaya aisi, and knowing me, and knowing Hashem, then what happens is, all those other th three things become beautiful tools for serving Hashem. They become gifts. They become holy. The Rebbe says, it's al derech, sheker achein, v'havel ha'yefi, ishe yiras Hashem, he sees halal. He uses the same lotion. She is praiseworthy. What does that mean? Sheker achein, that, that, that grace is, is false. Havel ha'yefi, and, and beauty is, is, is nothing. It's vanity. But the only thing that matters is Isha Yiras Hashem. But actually, what does it mean? It means like this. And there's, a, there's an old vart. They used to say like this. For the, for the, the Bachram, who are uh, in Shidduchim. So first you see, is there Chain? Okay, yeah, there's Chain. But Chain is uh, a Shekhar Chain. So you write down a zero on the paper. Then you see, is there Yefi? Yeah, she has Yefi. Oh, but so you write down another zero on the paper. Now, is there Yiras Shamayim, Yiras Hashem? Yeah, okay, give that a number and put that in front of the two zeros. So that when you have the Yiras Hashem, then the Chain and the Yefi become valuable. It's the same idea here, that the Chochmah and, 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 and the Gvura and, and, the, and, and, the, and the wealth that these things are not negative unto themselves. They're negative when they're divorced from the giver of these blessings. But when we realize that the whole tachlis of everything is knowing Hashem, then these things, these are like zeros that magnify, that extend the, the, the ability to serve Hashem uh, on an even greater level. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, if you have any questions, you can email to rabbi at soulwords.org. And... Uh, We'll see you tomorrow.